when I came back to make Mad Dog in uh, 1973, 74, I started to 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 want to make make Mad Dog. But I'd made two documentaries, feature documentaries, so I'd already made films. And the AFDC was going, but there was no film industry. And a really, I think, magical thing happened. That year, four filmmakers, myself, uh, Don Crombie, Peter Weir, and Fred Skepsey, we all made, we made four feature films, Caddy, Picnic Hanging Rock, Devil's Playground, and Mad Dog Morgan. I don't know about the other guys, but I didn't know any of them. And I don't think anyone knew anyone. The, and these were four movies that sprouted up completely independently and I think we would have made them whether it'd been an AFDC or not uh, most of the money f f for Mad Dog was from private investors we just wanted to make uh, some Australian films and that and then at Cannes the next year when there were those four films were shown at Cannes and uh, I think historically if you if you look at it that was the year that really started it worldwide suddenly the world said well, look at these four films these decent movies i tried to be really authentic with mad dog morgan in terms of australian history because i felt that i'd never seen a film which portrayed the um 1850s and those colonial days as they were i loved that book for the term of his natural life uh, and i'd, I'd all and i and, and it was a very violent book actually for the term of his natural life and uh, I did a lot of research on what was going on, and I couldn't believe it when I read that the police actually wanted to make a tobacco pouch out of uh, Morgan's uh, genitalia. And then I read that that was a com quite a common thing because they did it with kangaroo genitalia, and, they, and that was a, it was a sort of a strange ritual. So I thought, this is really bizarre, that the establishment would hunt people down and make tobacco pouches pouches out of their balls so um, this stuff that seemed outrageous was actually all true and it was a very violent society and I wanted to get that across simultaneously uh, there were powerful uh, mainstream movies like uh, Peckinpah's movies which had a lot of violence in them so I I didn't feel uh, I, I, I was encouraged by that because not only uh, did they show violence but the violence in Mad Dog was factually accurate. I saw Ned Kelly, Tony Richards' Ned Kelly, but I didn't really learn anything from it. In fact, I felt it was, to me, it tasted very uh, inauthentic, uh, to put it in a clumsy way. It just didn't seem authentic to me, historically or in, in any other way. And that's one of the reasons that I went deeply into the actual history of Mad Dog Morgan, even going to the original police reports and things. And I had a lot of help from Margaret Carnegie, who had written the, the history book on which it was based. The Bush Ranger film that I really liked as a kid was Peter Finch and Robbery Under Arms. I really liked that, I, I guess, because Peter Finch was fantastic. So uh, Mick Jagger was, is no Peter Finch, and uh, by a long shot. And so aside from the weakness of that performance as a Bush Ranger, in Ned Kelly, I didn't feel it was authentic, so I, I did learn a lesson from that, for to prepare me for Mad Dog. I did want to get a really good actor. The actors that nearly got the role in Mad Dog included um, Martin Sheen and Jason Miller, who'd done The Exorcist, and Stacy Keach was up for it, and they all wanted to do it, um, but we ended up going with Dennis. He seemed the most authentic to me. I was out of my depth um, uh, in the sense that, um, well, let me rephrase this, because I didn't know much, nothing scared me. I think uh, if I'd been more experienced, I probably wouldn't have hired Dennis Hopper to star as the movie, uh, which would have been a tragedy. But because I didn't know any better, I thought all Hollywood stars behave like this and you just have to deal with it. So that turned out to be terrific because Dennis gave a great performance. So, you know, blind enthusiasm and blind youth um, has its advantages. I flew into Taos, New Mexico with uh, Jeremy Thomas, my partner at the time, to meet Dennis Hopper. And uh, it was a, it's a bumpy ride into Taos. It was a small plane. 
and the plane stopped and uh, I jumped out at the end of the ra at the end of the runway was Dennis Hopper with a rifle and I thought god that really this could be mad dog and um, we introduced ourselves and he said come on come back to my my uh, my place and we got into this uh, pickup truck which was riddled with bullet holes and I said what are all those bullet holes and and he said oh the Indians have been shooting at me and I thought this is this is this is mad dog and he said and by the way make sure you're in your hotel room by 2 a.m. otherwise the Indians will be shooting at you and uh, and sure enough after 2 a.m. we did hear gunshots but he um, he just looked uh, he looked and felt perfect. Dennis had made Easy Rider, and he'd made the uh, the last movie. Um, his last movie, conveniently, was called the last movie, uh, and which he showed showed us in a cinema that he owned in Taos, New Mexico. I didn't know, and nor did Jeremy, that he'd basically basically been blacklisted in Hollywood because he told. Lou Wasserman, the head of Universal, to go expletive deleted. And telling the head of a studio that uh, in those days, probably even in these days, meant you were, you were blacklisted. So Dennis couldn't get hired, and he had a reputation for uh, carousing. But we really didn't know this. We didn't know anything about Hollywood or any of that kind of stuff. We were just thrilled to have Easy Rider as Mad Dog. It was a great fit. Rebel meets Rebel. And uh, that was really exciting. We paid him $50,000, which doesn't sound like much, but it was a big chunk of our small budget. And um, Dennis and his agent were delighted to, to get the job. Uh, Dennis genuinely liked the script. He really liked the character, and he could relate to the rebel character. And, and then after that, I don't think, you know, his so-called low point really... It didn't last for more than five minutes because after Mad Dog, he went straight to Apocalypse Now. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola called me when he was editing um, Apocalypse Now and he, because he was very intrigued to see Mad Dog, particularly Dennis in Mad Dog. So uh, I flew up to San Francisco with a print of Mad Dog and um, Coppola said, um, did you have any problems with Dennis and I lied and said no did you and he said well yeah I, he, he kept changing lines he was supposed to say Hiroshima mon amour and he kept saying Nagasaki mon amour I thought I don't see what's so bad about that um, and when I saw Coppola's wife's documentary on the making of Apocalypse Now Dennis is playing Mad Dog Morgan. I think he, he hadn't got rid of Mad Dog Morgan in his mind. His whole performance in Apocalypse Now, to me, looks exactly like his performance in, um, in, in Mad Dog. Mad Dog Morgan was a psychopath, uh, and Dennis brought that intensity to it, and also some tenderness, and uh, Mad Dog was a victim. He was driven mad by society. That's the theme of the movie, that society through cruelty can drive people crazy and uh, Dennis did a great job of of portraying that. Dennis was a full-on method actor at that time. That was convenient for him because Mad Dog drank a lot of rum which Dennis had researched before he arrived. So uh, Dennis took it further when we were shooting for example when we started shooting for example the makeup department came to me after two weeks and they said, look, Philippe, we love you, we love Dennis, but we can't go near him anymore because he, he hasn't washed since we started shooting because he keeps saying he's mad dog and the smell is so bad we just can't put his makeup on. I mean, we're gagging. So I went to Dennis and said, Dennis, you know, you're going to have to have a wash, man. He said, a wash? I'm... I'm Mad Dog Morgan, man. I don't wash. I'm Mad Dog. I said, I know you're Mad Dog, Dennis. But even he washed. There's the Murray River. He washed in the Murray. Uh, Dennis went, oh. And he took all his clothes off, jumped in the Murray and had a wash. Um, so he, was, he really was, I mean, it sounds like a joke, but he really was 
totally into it. So if you see the film, you can you can see the intensity of it. Because uh, Ned Kelly had been played by Mick Jagger, there was natural like suspicion of a Yank coming in to play another Bush Ranger. So there was res- there was initial resistance. Uh, from the crew and everyone about why is this American playing one of our heroes. But um, I pointed out to a lot of people there was no such thing as an Australian in 1850. Australians were Irish. There were very few people who had been born in Australia. They were Irish, they were Americans, they were from all over the place. Mad Dog Morgan was Irish. But really the turning point was when um, Dennis Scott you know, drunker and wilder than anyone else on the crew. And we had some pretty wild guys on the crew, some legendary uh, boozers. And as soon as that sort of childish uh, uh, competition was won by Dennis a few times, everyone accepted him as Mad Dog. Dennis didn't know anything about Australian Aborigines. Uh, You know, why should he? He grew up in Kansas City. And he wasn't really clear on the, on, the, on the difference between, at that time, between Africans, Aborigines. He just wasn't, you know, he wasn't clear on it. And um, he stupidly was saying things to David drunkenly and trying to be funny. He was saying things like, why don't you sh- shy my shoes? And which completely puzzled David, but he knew that it was not good. So David disappeared uh, about two, 10 days into the shoot, just completely disappeared. We called his wife in, in Sydney and she said, he's gone walkabout. The only way you'll be able to find him is get trackers in. So this was a nightmare. We had to reschedule everything to keep shooting and we got two trackers in. And um, they walked around David's motel room doing really mysterious things. It was fascinating to watch. I didn't, couldn't quite fear what they were picking up things and looking at stuff and then they said okay mate we'll find him for you mate and so off they go and uh, about four days later they bring David back and I said to David today you know what are you what what were you doing you can't just go walk about in the middle of a shoot it's been a huge problem and he said oh I had to ask the kookaburras and the trees about Dennis and I said really what did they what did they say He's David said, well, the kookaburras and the trees all say Dennis is crazy. And I said, look, David, I could have told you that. And please, you know, and uh, so then I got Dennis to apologize. I found out what had happened. David said that Dennis had been saying strange things to him. And so uh, Dennis apologized and then they were, became the best of friends. They became very close uh, and part and slept together in the same bed, not sexually, but slept together as the characters did in the bush in the movie. Uh, it was all part of Dennis's um, intense um, and real method acting. I'd never encountered it before because, I mean, I was pretty inexperienced. I had um, directed a, uh, a clinically insane man in my first movie, which maybe in some, I'm not saying Dennis is clinically insane at all, I'm not, but, uh, but it is amusing that I had dealt with a really wild situation on my first movie. But really I, I gave Dennis uh, the leeway uh, that he needed. There was one scene where uh, Mad Dog Morgan dies and uh, there was an old actor who's one lie, had to put his head on Dennis's chest, look up and say he's dead. And he, this old guy kept Dennis was obviously still alive he was gurgling and, go, and the guy would say he's dead so I took him aside and I said you know what what's wrong obviously he's not dead he's gurgling wait till he dies and he said look I, I did I needed the money I didn't tell anyone I'm completely deaf and I've got like 20 percent I can't see anything really I said oh well, what are we gonna do I wasn't gonna fire him it's, he said, I've got an idea. I'll get a 20-foot long stick, and when you want me to say he's dead, poke me. I said, that's a bloody good idea. So um, I get this long stick, 20 actors in the thing, Dennis dies, I poke the guy, he's dead, perfect. 
And then Dennis gets up and he says, listen, man, I've got to talk to you. I've worked with some motherfuckers in my time. I've worked with some real asshole directors, but I've never worked with an asshole who pokes actors with a stick. What is that, man? What are you doing? We're not puppets. We're not animals. We're not robots. So then I said, Dennis, cal I calmed him down and I explained what had happened and we kept going and everything was fine. One amusing Hopper story is when the owner of the motel, Ashen Face, said, I've got to show you something, Mr. Mora. So uh, we went to Dennis's room and the fan in the room was going, it had been tied into a knot and the owner was crying. He said, I I've never seen anything like this, mate. I said, no, nor have I. I've never seen anything like it. We're really sorry. We'll obviously pay for the damage. And uh, so I went to Dennis. I said, Dennis, why did you, how'd you, why and how on earth did you turn that metal fan into a knot? And uh, Dennis said, oh, I can't remember, man, but I don't know, man, it's a big night. A couple of days later, I notice he doesn't have his boots on. He's, he, it's Mad Dog, no, no boots on. I said, Dennis, where, where are your boots? And he says, fuck boots, man. I'm Mad Dog Morgan. I said, I know that, Dennis. I mean, we've been through this many times. I know you're Mad Dog Morgan, but yesterday Mad Dog had his boots on. It's the same scene. It's not about magic boots. Where are the boots? I don't know, man. I'm fucking Mad Dog. Okay, okay. So the uh, AD, I said, please, ever find the boots. So the AD brought back the boots about 25 minutes later from the motel in a block of ice. And Dennis looks at them and he says, ah, oh, yeah, I remember, man. Yeah, those boots, man, they reeked, man. They reeked, man. So I put them in the freezer. And so he thawed them out and shot the scene. I remember one scene really bothered Dennis, which was he asked me how I was going to handle the scene of him being raped by Max Fairchild. And I said, Dennis, uh, the prisoners are going to hold you down they're going to pull your pants down. We're going to reveal your ass. And then Max is going to shuffle around at his belt. And then I'm going to cut. And Dennis said, oh, okay. And uh, so I go, action. They hold Dennis down. He's screaming. They pull his pants down. We see his bum. It's a wide, wide is shot. Max fumbles with his belt. And I cut. And... Max looks at uh, Dennis's bum and he says, Jesus Christ, man, that's the ugliest bloody thing I've ever seen. And Dennis looks up at him and says, uh, no one's more pleased to hear that than me, Max. The other scene that um, was bothering, uh, well, there's something bothered Dennis throughout the shoot, and that was Frank Thring. Because Dennis, in his mental state of method state knew that Frank Thring was going to make a tobacco pouch out of his balls. So every time Frank Thring would come into a room, breakfast, lunch, dinner, Dennis would leave. He just, it just freaked him out. He didn't want to be in a hotel room next to him or anything else. And Frank um, was perturbed. Frank kept asking me, you know, doesn't Dennis like me? And I, it, it was hard to explain the truth uh, that um, Dennis was concerned about Frank turning his balls into a tobacco pouch. Frank Thring had a great sense of humour, and um, having read the script, the first time he met Dennis, he focused on his, um, I don't know how to describe, the, the, the genital area of the anatomy. Frank just fixed that with a big stare, and that freaked Dennis out, because, of course, Dennis had read the script as well, and in his... Uh, state thought that maybe Frank was seriously going to have a go at his balls. So this was a problem throughout the shoot uh, with uh, keeping Frank away from Dennis. Dennis was an incredible carouser and I'd never seen anyone, to be honest, consume that much alcohol um, and other stuff. I just, you know, but again I thought well, maybe this is what these stars do. But I actually worked myself up into a paranoia where I thought Dennis might die before we finished shooting and my whole career would be ruined. And I whipped up Jeremy as well and we wound ourselves up. This guy is going to die. And I said, well, I've got an idea. Um, let's cast his face in uh, gelatin, plastic, whatever you cast the faces in in those days. 
cast his face and if he dies we'll have a mask and we can do long shots of him and we'll schedule all the all the uh, close-ups and all this those the intimate scenes right right now so we, we did this so we got Ivan Durant the sculptor and painter to cast Dennis's face and Dennis said hey man what's this about uh, my face being cast what's that for and I said I've got this idea Dennis you're riding along on your horse you look up in the sky you see your own face and it blows up and Dennis says far out man far out that's fantastic so we're approaching the end of the shoot Dennis is healthier than any of us I'm completely wrecked Jeremy is wrecked everyone is Dennis is fine and I, and I say Dennis thank you so much you know we couldn't wait to get him out of the country because the police were hovering around the, the, the set with all the, the rumors and stuff and I said Dennis you've been fantastic which he had been and he said wait a minute man you haven't shot that scene where I'm riding along on my horse I see my face and it blows up and I said well, you're right. So we shot that. And then this is why I think Dennis really is a great actor because I tried to get rid of him again. I said, Dennis, that was great. Thank you so much. He said, wait a minute. There's a scene where I'm dead. And I said, well, we've got the mask of your face. It's a long shot. We're just, and, and this is the great actor talking. He said, listen, man, no one plays me dead. I play me dead. I act me dead. I said, okay, okay. So we, then we shot that. We wrapped, and Dennis wanted to ride off on a horse from the set as Mad Dog, and he wanted to um, drink one bottle of rum and pour one bottle of rum on the real Mad Dog Morgan's grave. So he took off um, in a car with my mother, actually, and Richard Brennan, and um, poured the rum on Morgan's grave. And the Victorian police, who captured, who shot the real Mad Dog Morgan, were into this whole myth, and they wanted to catch Mad Dog Morgan. Redux, they wanted to catch him again, and so they were waiting for Dennis. And uh, Dennis was driving a car. This is the story that that I got from a few people. Dennis was driving the car, and the police stopped him and he's dressed as Mad Dog, and they arrested him for drunken driving. And the next morning he went in front of the judge, and the judge said, uh, Mr. Hopper, I've looked at your, uh, your alcohol uh, breathalyzer test here, and uh, you're clinically dead. And uh, I've never seen anything like it. And, and uh, not only will you not be allowed to drive in the state of Victoria, you will never be allowed to be a passenger in the state of Victoria and you are being taken straight to the airport. And so Mad Dog left. There are a lot of stunts in Mad Dog and um, having now directed a lot of movies, I hate stunts. They're dangerous. Any way you look at it, it's really dangerous. And it's one of the, I'd say, worst parts of my job as a director is dealing with stunts and safety issues because it's just... Any way you look at it, uh, hazardous. And um, Grant Page, was a, when we made Mad Dog, was a great stuntman. I totally trusted him, and I would go into minute detail with him about how things would go. But at the end of the day, he's the expert. It's his uh, health at risk and life and limb at risk, and at some point, if he signs off, then the director's got to go with it unless it's blatantly crazy. Well, Grant was very, uh, very experienced. I had this idea, which he really liked, and it was inspired by Jean Cocteau uh, reverse motion tricks in Orfei and Testament d'Orfei. I had this idea of setting, of, of Bad Dog having a nightmare and of him coming out of water on fire. I just like that image of fire and water and I thought it would be freaky, uh, nightmare to see someone come out of water on fire. So uh, the idea was, the only way of doing it was to set Grant on fire and have him dive into water. So um, we set that up and um, as I recall uh, we did two takes, one for the fall 
into the water, shot in reverse motion, and you see him coming out of the water. It looks fantastic. I, I still get a kick out of that shot. And then we did a second setup where he lands on fire um, on, a, on a ledge and Dennis is there freaking out and then Dennis would wake up. Well, that second bit went, that second bit of the shot, uh, that second setup went south because for some reason Grant either didn't give the signal in time or the person, his assistant who was supposed to watch him for the signal uh, to put him out with the blankets and the, all the stuff they had to put out. Uh, it was just, just went a little bit too long and um, he started screaming and then he was put out and, and he was, uh, uh, he went to hospital and he was uh, burnt quite badly, but he was fine. I mean, there's a happy, there's a happy end to the story. Uh, he was back on set within days and doing more fantastic stunts. We were fresh, we were, we were new, but there were very experienced people on these movies. Mike Malloy, who was the DP, had just shot Clockwork Orange and Barry Lyndon. I mean, it's not small change. And he'd seen a lot of stunts. And so, you know, the DP works with the stunt man. They, everyone knows what's going on. This was not like bumbling around setting people on fire. The, the Grant Page had done countless movies. So were there other sets where stuff... Um, was a bit disorganized maybe I don't know I can't I just know that uh, I was confident that the people that I was working with knew what they were doing and they did but sometimes tragically um, things can go south Mad Dog uh, was a very violent script um, it, they were violent times uh, and you know looking back at that time violence was in the air this is the Vietnam War was going on. Uh, uh, you know, we were conscious of violence. Uh, in, in the art world, Francis Bacon was painting, had been painting pictures of people's faces mashed up for, you know, 20 years. Uh, Clockwork Orange was very violent. So it was in, this was not in the whole, in worldwide, this was not some weird thing I was doing. But in Australia that had hardly had made any movies for a long time, it was, uh, it did shock people seeing some of this graphic violence. It was supposed to, that was the idea. It was, it was part of my concept of the film. Um, and uh, I don't have any regrets about that. The distributors had never had to market films themselves. They got the American campaigns in or the British campaigns and they used that. They never had to think up campaigns. So it was a whole new paradigm for them. Picnic at Hanging Rock had been successful um, and the campaign for that had been a sort of a lyrical thing. Well, Mad Dog was not lyrical, but they got the same artwork and designers to do the poster for Mad Dog. They tried to make Mad Dog lyrical. They tried to soften an image of uh, a guy with two guns. Well, you can't really do that. It's a contradiction. If I think if they'd just gone full on, this is the Australia you never saw, this is brutal, you know, uh, but if you try and sell, if you sell something that something isn't, people feel cheated. If you, I think if you, if they'd been more straight up in the campaign uh, about what the film was, it probably would have been more successful. It got fantastic reviews. The critics knew what it was, but you know, reviews are one thing, box office is another. And so the box office was disappointing. Uh, the government officials, uh, who were shocked by the violence and uh, the just the general violent tenor of the movie? Um, they said it was you know disaster, and they were the ones who said it wouldn't make a dime. And then Mad Dog at Cannes that year was the only film that sold. I think we got an advance of three hundred thousand dollars, which was amazing for an Aussie movie at that time. And it opened in uh, the U.S. in forty theaters. It was the first Australian movie to get an opening like that. Well, certainly it was the first Australian film to, that showed that you could get a release in the United States, whatever happened, and that meant that there was a door was, a door was open. It was particularly well reviewed in, um, the LA, in LA, uh, and a lot of the, uh, the, what they then called the alternate press, but mainstream press praised it. Playboy gave it a great review. 
the New York Post in, uh, gave it a bad review. They said everyone involved in this film should be locked up and the key thrown away, which actually sold tickets. It was, a, it was actually a great selling review. No one had released an Australian film in America, so it was very hard to know how to market the thing. Um, and was it an art film or was it a violent exploitation film? It crossed genres, really. Dennis Hopper was not popular in America at that time in the press. He, he had a reputation, and um, it wasn't. We although we thought it would be a plus, and obviously it was creatively and event historically, it's turned out to be a great plus that he was in it at that time. Um, people in the American press uh, generally want wanted to have a go at him because they thought he was, you know, out of line. So that, so I don't know how you could have overcome that. Um, the actual physical, the artwork itself was okay. Uh, we got some, as I say, some fantastic reviews which are on the poster. And look, you know, you never know uh, how a film's going to go. There's so many factors in it. I was just delighted that it opened uh, as wide as it did in America. Uh, that was a, a, an achievement in itself. I like Mad Dog a lot. Uh, I like it because it's raw. I like the rawness of it. I like the fact that it's unselfconscious, and I wasn't pulling any punches. I wasn't trying to. I think it's it's aged well. I think if you look at a lot of films from the 70s, they look very dated. My personal opinion is that Mad Dog Morgan hasn't dated much, because uh, it's it that that rawness. Um, has helped at last. I was um, working with Philippe as an editor. I've uh, been friendly with him for many years in London, in the sort of swinging London era. And I was um, an editor, working as an editor, and I edited Brother Can You Spare a Dime, which was a compilation documentary. And during the making of that, Philippe <clears throat> had this book from um, uh, Margaret Carnegie, which was a book about Daniel Morgan, a uh, bush ranger. And, um, and Philippe, you know, was the, wanting to direct a film. We'd, in fact, we'd written a screenplay together, um, I think, during the making of, or possibly before even, uh, Brother King Spare a Dime, uh, which we tried to, to make, but Philippe was going to produce and he was going to direct. Um, and then I went to, we went to, to Australia because of, um, because of Daniel Morgan and the possibility of being able to set a film up in Australia at a moment of a sort of a brand new thing. The film started off because we thought there was a possibility that we could find the, the resources to make this film and to make this this sort of um, unusual western uh, around the surrounding sort of bush ranger tale. A bush ranger film meet a Sam Peckinpah film. You know, that was yes, as simple as that. It's sort of a a slightly a, an exotic an exotic western um, which was set in Australia, but still had stories of revenge and and western themes uh, running through it uh, with you know an outlaw and a sheriff and you know it's horses and posses and and indians and aboriginals and so you know it, it had you know all those classical themes hiding out guns on the run it was very very ambitious film with um you know period film with hundred plus speaking parts and uh, and a lot of sets construction uh, with not really any no knowledge at all of that um, it was just you know done by uh, experience of seeing that being done and working with people who also you know who, people who had who had done it before and were more experienced because there was you know already you know a lot of a lot of production in Australia although the sort of film industry hadn't really become a big big industry well I suppose we were slightly out of our depth but Philippe had been sort of, uh, involved in cinema, you know, or, or, well, before he was an adult, you know his, his, you know, his mother was an artist, his father was an art dealer, though he was very involved in, in films from a young age, and he understood and, you know, had directed film in, Mel in, um, in London um, when he was very young, and then he made these very acclaimed compilation documentaries. So he was somewhat in advance of, say, when he was somebody of 26, he really knew about making films, and I had grown up in the film business, so, so I had been, um, you know, I've been Champing the bit to move forward in my, in my in my life, so it um, there was sort of it was a moment we were young and maybe we, we were completely green, I admit, but you know intelligible and knowledgeable uh, for somebody who was green.
we wanted to find a sort of personality who would have some sort of echo of of um, American cinema, of sort of Western cinema, even uh, in it. And uh, we were looking at various actors and having uh, we had done very little money to spend on this part and big ambitions uh, to get a movie star in the film. And uh, we went through some hilarious first time experience with agents being offered up extraordinary people um, of who we could get. And then, you know, we didn't think Dennis Hopper would be attainable because, you know, he's a gigantic star post um, Easy Rider, but, you know, at the moment, a little bit down on his luck due to his sort of his reputation in Hollywood. And um, we went to meet his agent, who we called Robert Raison, who was a um, very exotic character, and he arranged for us to go to meet Dennis. And we uh, flew to Albuquerque and then took a little plane to Towers. And uh, Dennis did arrive. Uh, I think he was in a, it was like a truck, one of those a truck flatbed trucks, and uh, there were bullet holes all over it. And um, he, you know, he appeared, and he really, he he, he was straight, <coughs> exactly as you wanted him to be. You know, he didn't disappoint at all as a character. And uh, he was in very very extreme conditions. He was in very extreme condition at that time, and uh, it was very sort of um, difficult to deal with somebody like that. Uh, but he was you know, very, very up for doing the movie, and we spent a week there. It was around about a week in Taos, and I hung with him, and uh, we were fully entertained by all the, all the proceedings, which were again you know, very, very exotic for... I'd never seen anything like that. He was gun in hand and um, whooping it up, and, uh, he, you know, he showed us um, how a, cow a cowboy lived in those days. You know, it was... It was it really lived up to the expectation of what you wanted it, what we wanted him to be, a sort of, a, sort of heroic figure who was a sort of cultural icon, um, and he embodied in you know, it all that sort of, from sort of, uh, you know, cinema of John Ford to Easy Rider, you know, you know, through James Dean, and it had all that going for it, and that was very exciting, you know, for two cinema brats, which we were because we were, you know, we were into it beyond. We were so enthusiastic about films, which was captivated Dennis. You know, we were really, what you call, you know, well, yeah, movie brats. You know, really talking about movies and knowing a lot of big knowledge about films because of having made *Brother King's Paradigm* and living a life of cinema. And Dennis had been into cinema, you know, all his, you know, all his adult life. So he was, in the lucid moments, you know, we had magnificent conversations. And he was looking forward to coming to be in Australia for six weeks. Within the system, of course. Um, he was considered to very difficult to, ha to, to deal with, um, but he was incredibly successful and a huge cultural icon for millions of people, millions of young people. Dennis Hopper was you know, a major figure of counterculture, uh, a figure of you know, a, 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 an area of life that he courted. And um, that was you know, sort of, when you're young, if somebody like that is an heroic figure. And um, that we thought also is, you know, um, Filmmakers, we thought, well, this can help us our film get to other people who want to see a film about an outlaw, and we've got a genuine outlaw. You know, we've got the real thing. You know, and little did we know that having the real thing was going to make the film somewhat difficult to make, because it was a wild experience which then imbued the crew with a certain wildness. When the lead actor was um, sort of, on, you know, odd, odd moments, completely on the rampage, and um, that uh, gave the film a certain edge and a certain sort of vitality and uh, it was an extraordinary performance from Dennis. I remember I couldn't, when he arrived at the airport um, in Sydney, he arrived with nothing. He had nothing, nothing. And um, I, I said, where's your bag? They don't bring a bag. I said, I said, I've just got, well, I'm standing in my passport's here. I'm here for the movie. You, you, you order it, but you give, me the, you give me the clothes. I'm here. And he arrived, he had nothing. They're nothing, not a bag, not a book, nothing. Just the clothes he stood up in, Levi suit, cowboy boots, and a passport. And that is somewhere to travel. For him, he just came on an adventure. I mean, he was a method, you know, he was trained in that, in, uh, in, the, in this me method acting um, school. And um, he wanted to sort of in inhabit the role, but also have an incredibly good time in doing that, you know. So it was a combination of party and getting into the part, which included um, living like an outlaw. Uh, to you know, he would you know he was arrested and put in jail for 
I know, well, go on. I think within a night of him arriving in Sydney, he was already in fighting down at the docks, got into a, a punch up somewhere. And uh, we, um, once we, we, we got him out of, of Sydney, you know, after the costume fittings and all that, it was sort of, there was less, it was more for the pastoral. But uh, during the city, it was sort of suddenly, it was sort of a rude awakening as to what was going to happen during the film. But the, the other actors, he got on very well with the other actors. And um, the sort of, it's, then it became sort of more of a troupe. And all the, 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 it was, I mean, drinking is, uh, at that moment, was sort of like a, a proud uh, pastime and an institution. And, you know, to be even drunk during the day making a film would be, of course, considered very, very unprofessional, but it went on in on various movies. And this film was full of full of drinking and, 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 um, and I would say all the other, any other substance that a man could get hold of in Sydney in those days, you know, it was, it was, it was something like that. Out of those hundred stories, that, I mean, maybe half of them were true, but, you know, Dennis collapsed in the middle of scenes, uh, which would have been remained in films, scenes that were in the film, which were so effective and dramatic, so maybe he did it on purpose. I mean, he was on the way to die in the film, and um, he knew it, so he got into a very extreme situation. Out of hours, there was a lot of mayhem and being turfed out of hotels, very, very rock and roll. You know, it was um, a lot of room destruction and um, hard living. Uh, the, the way that um, when we hadn't been used to, and the crew wanted to, wanted to um, endorse it, and uh, it was... Some of the people worked every day, but I don't know how... There was sort of a nucleus of people who worked every day, but there was a, a sort of party going on around the film. There was a sort of t to, to keep Dennis happy, this party sort of became, emerged, which, was, um, which we, we enjoyed as well. And the other actors were... You know, Jack Thompson was there, and I mean, he, was, he, was, he, 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 he enjoyed our company and we all had an enormous, incredible fun. I mean, I remember, I remember difficulty and uh, naivety, and I remember incredible fun, you know, I remember it. I remember just, you know, an incredible fun of um, an innocence of what could happen and how we got through it um, and how we finished the film. I've, I've got no idea really of thinking back to it. And of course, I could never think of working on a film like that now. There's an opening scene in the film when he comes along and he punches a guy in the face, you know. That was very Dennis at that time, you know. He could have done that, you know, just walk along, somebody hear somebody say something, he'd like to whack him, you know. I mean, that was, yes. You had to be on your toes, you know. You had to be on your toes with him. He was, you know, he was a very... But adorable as well. I had wonderful rides with him. I used to drive him to the set, you know. And I, I used to love driving in the morning. I was the guy who was driving, you know. I was producer-driver on that film, you know. I used to drive Dennis to him from the set you know, with a, Angus Forbes, many of the, the photographer Angus Forbes and myself, and Dennis, and we would drive. And some of these the drives were like two or three, two hours, two or three hours, out to the sets, and it was wonderful. I mean, I had wonderful stories with Dennis, incredible tales of Hollywood and the past of John Wayne and James Dean and, and all that incredible history, um, and you know that side of, of Dennis. I mean, he was absolutely lucid, um, and and um, and brilliant, um, you know, ninety percent of the time, and the stories have built up around the moments of madness. Well, I wasn't there. I just heard about that he had a um, bottle of tequila and he wanted to go to the grave and have a drink with Morgan. And he um, he he got. I think he got there. Maybe that was another time he was arrested. I mean, this happened. I mean, there was the Dennis of the Maple was not an everyday of the film, and the days we dreaded were the, his days off. You know. Because if he was on the movie, he was with us, and the days he was off, he was there, with, were there, and he would either take a car or have a car with his assistant or with his friend who was with him, and they go off, and you know, we should have had a tracking device on them. I, I really do think, in a way, um, if you can remember, you weren't there. It was a bit like you know, the 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 the, it's, it's the, the myth and the reality over the years has. has you know, I find it difficult to remember what stories are true and what stories are not true, because you know there were sort of there were so many stories going on. Um, this, I suppose, the destruction of the hotel rooms 
which in a way uh, we applauded because it was rock and roll, you know. And um, but finally, after the, the last motel room, we had nowhere to go. It was very difficult, you know. We we had great difficulty in staying in hotels on the our way around in New South Wales and Victoria, especially in Beechworth and Holbrook. And I'm sure they'll, you know, I'm sure it's a, there is a still a legend there of the, the trail of destruction led by Dennis. When it came ta- time to be action, he was he was there. You know, he was back in a moment of professionalism. <coughs> And uh, for whatever what anybody says about Mad Dog and um, and um, Dennis, he was he was doing his job um, and turning up on the set and and doing it um, in the way that he was able to do it that at that moment in the career, in, his, in his in his career. Of course, you know, since then Dennis is a reborn man, a completely different person. You know, and been directing films and acting films, and is a you know become a very very close friend and is. And is somebody who you know is a magnificent person, you know, and a magnificently you know, creative person, who does so many things. And and the film, you know, they sort of um, it, this is part of Mad Dog um, life was Dennis Hopper as a character and personality, and and the sort of film had really, and and many films do develop a life uh, for the six weeks that they're being made. And uh, of course, Mad Dog has, uh, has been sort of mythified. Um, the stories have been mythified around it, but it was, you know, it was an, a very extreme because we were also trying to do something um, in the scope of the film, which was was um, on top of the the sort of mythology around the film. We had also had to get it done, and um, we did shoot the film in six weeks. I think six weeks in a couple of days, and uh, there was terrible weather, and there was there was storms, um, washed away sets, and um, Horses that bolted and actors that wouldn't get on horses and 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 uh, you know, lack of money. When you're making films, you often need, you need money to do all these tricks on the films. But all the tricks on that film were done with um, without knowledge. I mean, the guns and the explosions and the um, exploding head and things like that they were made by artists and they were done by um, trial and error. They were done like a film would be done today. It was done in a much more Sort of ad hoc, and it hadn't been. It was you know people were bringing the special effects man was a, uh, was a guy who was also doing the set dressing, and he say he was a prop man. The prop man did the explosions, you know he did the uh, explosions and the guns and everything else. And now when you make a film, you know you need a team of six people holding the guns. You know it's sort of like um, it was a it was a different spirit of filmmaking, and so in it which enabled you to make a film of that size, you know for this home market. Let's try and pack the film out with as many well-known actors as we can get in this film. And uh, Philippe knew a lot of actors, and there were a lot of people wanted to be in the film. So it was sort of like, virtually all the actors that one went to for the parts, they would you know come and do two or three days. So we had you know, people who were starring in TV series, or people who had been starring in in films, and, and got Frank Thring in, in the film, which was you know real, you know, so satisfied to have Frank Thring in the film. Um, and that was Dennis was very pleased that, that Frank Thring was in the film as well, and they you know, had a great time telling tales, stories. You know, when they were sitting on their deck chairs waiting for the film, you know, there was a sort of shared experience of the big movie set. And um, then all the other actors, you know, particularly Jack Thompson, had a wonderful, he was wonderful in the film, and um, we were very happy to get Jack. I think he was the second actor we part, we cast with Jack. So we cast Dennis. And then everybody wanted to be in a film with Dennis, you know, and to have scenes with Dennis. So that was really, I suppose, the reason we managed to get so many actors who were stars in their own right in theatre, TV and movies. Michael Pate and John Hargreaves and uh, Graham Lundell. And knowing sort of health and safety issues now of stunts, when I see what we did with Grant Page and what he was prepared to do and wanted to do, um, uh, it was, it's, you know, something that's absolutely terrifying. I mean, you, 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 have the, you know, the stunt is, um, you know, jumping backwards on fire into a very shallow pool at the end of it, at the bottom of a, a falls with barely any safety of stuff around. And no, you know, yeah, he got through it alive. But, um, and it's an incredible image. And it was, today would be done digitally. And it was a fabulous idea of Philippe's to do this green like that. But wow, you know, it's, um, you know, it defies belief 
that some you know, a, that somebody would do that uh, in the sake of for the sake of a movie. You know, it's stuntmen are incredible. And Grant Page is an incredible stuntman and a very brave man and um, a bit crazy. You know, the Dale Dryden and he got burned. Yeah, and yeah. it didn't. And it, it, when he and when he went back, it just didn't work. The whole thing. I think he yeah he went off backwards, but it didn't work. There was something wrong with the water gel. Anyway, but then it had to be real. He wanted to do it again. You know. It's very it's difficult working with stuntmen. Uh, it's people who are real stuntmen who really do the stunt and get uh, hurt, probably as possible, and to do it again and again, you know, especially something like that. But we needed to do it again because we hadn't got the shot. You know. so we tried to get the film into the main selection of Cannes, but uh, we didn't manage to achieve the main selection. But we were invited into this sidebar event, which is, the, which is called the First International Festival of Westerns. I think there were only, maybe there was one other. Anyway, there was like a dozen movies in this sidebar event, which were sort of westerns made of the year, or films that were considered westerns. And we were, you know, there was a jury of you know, half a dozen people, and, and Mad Dog won and that jury a pri a prize, you know. But it looked good on the poster, John Ford Trophy, um, Festival of Westerns. And, you know, it got some really, very good response in America, you know, and it was, you know, um, understood as western, more in America. And I've, you know, remember the quotes, and in fact, there's a poster outside which has got sort of quotes from, you know, critics of the day, which were you know, pretty positive. We launched it in Cannes, and I don't think there was any really um, comment about the violence of the film. You know. And I don't remember there being particularly... And maybe in Australia there was some um, a comment about the violence, but I don't think it was something that was really focused on. I don't know, I mean, I, you'd have to remind me if that was. I think there was a... I mean, you focus on the good reviews, you know, and I can't remember. I remember there was sort of some impact, and uh, we had difficulty distributing the movie. But where it was shown, people liked it, and it sort of built a sort of certain reputation. It was shown here in the National Film Theatre, got very good response, and and um, it had sort of some festival life. I'd say more than a commercial life. It was bought by an American company, um, Cinema Shares, I think they were called, and um, that was sort of a. a not really a happy story. The American distribution was not a very happy story. I mean, you're very, very keen to get your film distributed in America. It's the most difficult place. And we were, you know, it was incredible when we made this deal with these people, but it didn't, you know, I, it didn't, it, that didn't deliver our expectations, I have to say, to be truthful. And um, we got to get open. We had a big opening in New York. Um, but there was, I think today, when the knowledge of the one gains, you know, the film would have been handled completely differently and I would, you know, you'd always love to see again a film um, marketed and that you've made with hindsight, you know, so that's why, but the film was, you know, it was a, you know, the film is stands and is a, a very, very ambitious first work. I think it's an incredible first film that Philippe made. Yeah, I salute the ambition of making the first film so big and uh, I think, we, you know, he pulled it off, pulled it off and uh, it was very complicated film to direct under a, a, a lot of stress. It was, you know, stressful not only because of the light stories about Dennis and all that, but you know there was a lot of ad actors to direct, and a lot of scenes, and there was rewriting at night, and there was, you know, problems we'd get in, and Philip would have to rewrite scenes and shooting a movie. Even though you've got the knowledge of doing it before, or you know, shooting and it still was a sort of you know, this. The size of that was a brand new experience. Um, so that was you know, a great, great experience for me, I have to say, and uh, and um, I've, it was, I was a very happy experience that I could live in Australia during the making of that film for you know, a few years. Oh, Dennis Hopper, Dennis Hopper. Wow, uh, that was uh, at a time I think when he was finding uh, a lot of uh, solace in substance. Uh, and uh, it didn't matter at all how, how snowed under he was, excuse the pun. Um, he never forgot uh, the, the physics of filmmaking. And because he was sort of like being very energetic, horses didn't know what he wanted. So he'd pull on the reins, he'd let the reins go. And he's standing there and he's got to deliver some line. And the horse would step forward because he'd yanked the reins and, and cover him. And he never, for, he never lost it. He'd always duck under the head and he'd be talking underneath the horse's head. And then the horse would step back so he'd come out again. 
And, and he never, didn't matter how, under the weather he was uh, for any reason, he never forgot his, his technical ability to stay on the camera. He was a uh, go-anywhere guy, you know, this method thing. Uh, he epitomised it right there and then. Rehearsals, forget it. We, I think, if I remember, we just shot it and you had to cover the whole area, be ready for anything. He'd walk behind the camera and you'd try and spin around, but you knew there were crew there and lights and things, so you'd have to let him out. But uh, he'd just go anywhere he damn wanted. And uh, I think Philippe then would have to try and work out how to get the other bit that he's missed and put it together. And I don't think a lot of the times he did get what he wanted. He just had to, later on in the edit, patch it all together. Um, he was a pretty wild man back then. People were always trying to get an overseas actor because they'd be a, a money spinner, a bit of a box office draw. Um, and it was difficult, actually. Uh, as I said earlier, the you know often they'd come out and and try and sort of feel that they knew better, uh, but they quickly settled into the way we were we would be making a film. I think Dennis uh, didn't worry a damn about any of that. He doesn't worry about cameras. Or no, back then he didn't. He just was told that's your area. There's your stage out there. Go do it, and he just did it. So he he didn't have any problems with it at all. It was like, you keep up with me, otherwise you're a goner. <laughs> Philippe was as cool as a cucumber. He'd just stand there smiling and laughing and sort of enjoying what, what Hopper was doing. Um, he never really did, to me, actually, ever portray his problems of that man, of that actor. He just always had this smile on his face and <laughs> seemed to be enjoying it thoroughly. Grant's awesome. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, back then he was... Awesome. I mean, when he jumped into that pond, that was 80 feet. And I said, have you done some training on this? Because 80 feet's a long way, you know, you, you could get badly hurt. He said, yeah, yeah, I jumped off the, man, in the, the Manly Ocean Pool had a big diving board, I think it was 30 feet. He said, oh, yeah, I've jumped off there a couple of times. It's OK, yeah, 80 feet's only another 50 feet. And off he went, psh, straight in. But he came up with blood coming out of his ears and his nose and all. Oh, he took a heck, of a heck of a bang on that. The fire stunts always used to terrify me. In those early days, we, did, we had somehow, for some reason, fire and nudity and, and, and big car stunts seemed to be the de rigueur for all the films. And, but fire always got me. I was terrified of fire. And this gel they used to put on, and they'd be yelling and saying, I'm ready now, the gel's on, we've got to go, we've got to go, because it dried very quickly and then... It, it didn't work or something and you could hear them yelling that we've got to go we've got to go and my heart had started going i used to hate it we saw, i saw we saw a couple of actors burnt not actors but stuntmen burnt not uh, too badly but burnt and um one of them screaming to get out of the gear because you know it, it had dried up and now the flame was getting at him and fire no i hate fire and and now that cgi can do it i i feel a lot calmer about the whole thing but they were pretty awesome guys back there when they'd just shove all this goop on and light themselves up and blaze into it. Uh, was awesome. I was invited to play in the, in the piece. I, uh, I first of all got in touch with uh, Dennis through his agent, who ended up being my agent as well, a manager rather, uh, in uh, Los Angeles, Michael McLean. And... Uh, I spoke to him and said, "You're coming out to." I just wanted to make sure that he was doing it, and I said, uh, "Well, you know, Paul, come. I can't think of uh, someone better to uh, to do this." Um, and uh, then, uh, so having satisfied myself that he was doing it, the reason I, that I was happy for him to be doing it is, I mean, remember, I, 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 if you will, the effect that uh, Easy Rider had had on a whole generation of filmmakers. We saw that this is a, that's a lot of guts. That's uh, that's pretty wild, man. And uh, so uh, I was excited to be working with Dennis Hopper. Uh, but when he came, I uh, I felt that there was something that I had to say to him. And I met and met him in his hotel room. This is before we got to the location, and said, uh, I just want to say this before we we get involved in the making of the film and you're the character of Mad Dog and I'm the character of Mannering in pursuit of you. I'm your nemesis. I, before we get to that relationship, I just want to say to you that this character is central to 
the Australian view of ourselves and uh, a an Im really important character. This isn't something made up by a scriptwriter. This is part of our real history. You betray him and I'll never forgive you. These bushrangers were such an important part of uh, almost a century of Australia's development. Uh, and they, they were all sorts of things. And they weren't the same as an outlaw in America or an outlaw in Britain at the time or an outlaw in Africa. They were uniquely part of our convict heritage and the second generation of um, Danny Morgan, you know, all of that. So telling that tale properly was terribly important to me. My favorite Dennis Hopper story is uh, a legendary, bless his heart, gone to young Great Vale, uh, journalist, Jim Oram, who was the, the kind of the closest we ever got to gonzo journalism in Australia. He'd get down and out with the dirty and he'd get the story. With, but he also wrote a definitive life of the Pope. He was a great journalist, Bill. Uh, Jim, rather, a great journalist. And uh, he'd had, he had heard of all the wildness going on in the making of this film and how Dennis was truly mad. And uh, Dennis and I had sort of romped together and got drunk together. Uh, he said to me at one stage, uh, Jesus Christ, they told me you were crazy. You're not crazy. You know? <laughs> uh, and it was like disappointment. It sent me a real crazy. And uh, I, I was called into the motel room next door. I'd heard ah, <laughs> thump, thump, and drinking sounds going on for about an hour. I walk in, and here is Orem. And he has his portable typewriter, like, like a concertina, like a squeeze box. And he's dancing on Dennis's bed playing <laughs> the dancing. And Dennis had taken Jim right into his mad dog world. Yeah, Dennis and I went on to be friends for a long time. He lived the, the life of a mad, isolated man and a man driven mad by isolation and all of that. Yeah, it was a very, uh, it was a very painful experience for us. I mean, it would be very hard to play that role for any actor and say, yeah, I loved it. I had a wonderful time. I mean, the man is hunted from the word go. He, there's a constant sense of betrayal and walking to his own inevitable death in the end, it's a grotesque tale. He brought an intensity and an insanity to the role that honoured the man we talked of and for, I believe is the best portrayal of an Australian bushranger to date. It is an uncompromising, honest performance of the desperation of the man known as Mad Danny Morgan. Working with Dennis Hopper and Mad Dog Morgan, I didn't like the man, I didn't like him at all, although since then I've seen him in a lot of films and I like him, but then I didn't like him at all. Arrogant, son of a bitch, speaking in an Irish accent all the time, day and night, good thing I suppose, method acting, but such an arrogant bastard. He invited us all to a party in his room one night and everybody was on the, on the marijuana in those days and uh, everybody was smoking, including him, and... He and I didn't have a girl, but a lot of guys had their girls with them, and a lot of guys took girls with them. And he opened the door up to welcome you into his room, dragged the girl in and slammed the door on the guy. And just dragged the girl and took her. And the girls were so beholden to be with Dennis that they didn't protest. And I saw this happening. So I went around to one of the windows, and I was a little bit on the, you know, how's your father with the old marijuana? And I could see it happening. Another guy would turn up and bang, and the girl would be in, the guy. Well, I found it hilarious. And I, I saw about 10 or 15 girls just dragged in, and they were going, oh, what's happening? They were giggling and laughing, and Dennis is prowling amongst them, you know, doing the grope and carrying on. And uh, the girls were all giggling and laughing. Well, I was watching through a window. I was absolutely paralytic laughing. I found it so hilarious. But um, the guys weren't too happy about it. But I don't know why. I mean, if he did that with one of my girls, I mean, I would have knocked the door down, for God's sake. Probably if I wasn't on the marijuana, but they were probably so high they didn't care. They're probably all peace, peace, brother. Dennis Hopper was one of the most extraordinary actors I've worked with. I had been in awe of him, of course, um, since Easy Rider as an actor and just as a, a film goer. 
uh, and I was told that I would have a scene, one scene in the film, and the scene would be with Dennis Hopper. I was taken out to the location out in country Victoria somewhere. Um, uh, I was taken out the night before. Eventually, the next morning, I was taken to the makeup caravan, and there was Dennis Hopper with a six pack hanging from his hand, already totally pissed. Um, I thought this is going to be a, a good day because I knew that I was playing a character called Italian Jack and I was to be held up by the bush ranger, uh, Mad Dog Morgan, played by Dennis Hopper, who at this stage is totally and utterly drunk. Uh, we eventually get out to the location. I'm in my little van with my horse in front and suddenly we rehearse it with the, the stand-ins on the big racehorse that uh, Dennis Hopper's to ride. And uh, there's suddenly a, an argument. Dennis Hopper wants to do the rehearsal himself on the, this huge racehorse. Uh, he does the rehearsal, it's sort of all right. Mind you, I'd seen him in the dressing room just earlier do a couple of lines of coke. Um, so he's now coked out of his brain and drunk. Uh, we rehearse the scene, he gets through the rehearsal okay, then we go for a take. And he has to ride into the, the scene, pull me up, I, I say something in Italian, pause, and he then has to rear the horse. And, uh, but none of this happened because he rode into, into the wide shot uh, did that with the horse, whatever you do with horses, reared up, went berserk, jumped over the thing that I was, the little cart that I had, and uh, they took two hours to find him somewhere <laughs> down wherever it was. That was my great Dennis Hopper experience. <laughs>